Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Jewel Collins Smith Museum of Fine Art. Uh, my name is Chris Hecox, and I'm the executive director of the Jay and Susie Gooch Performing Arts Center across the street. I uh, just wanted to welcome everyone to this, e to this evening um, and wanted to thank everyone here that is a member and a sponsor and a donor to the University and the Museum. Thank you for your support and also the support of the Phillips Education Fund, which is supporting this, this exhibition as well. Um, we just wanted to do a couple of thank yous and a little bit of housekeeping here. Um, this exhibition would not um, be up if it wasn't for the curatorial work of Dennis Harper. So thank you, Dennis, for all of your work. Yes. Um, it was uh, installed by Chris Carr and his great work as well. Uh, Danielle Funderburk and Jessica Hughes with all the logistical work that it takes to, to put up an exhibition of this caliber and as well as our design and our marketing team, which includes Aaron LaRue, Tasha Watson, Charlotte Hendricks, and Jonathan Osborne. So, um, in addition to the exhibition and the evening, uh, today's program or this evening's program, there are a number of supporting programs um, around this exhibition that I just wanted to mention to you so that you can put them in your calendar. So on Saturday, which is tomorrow from 10 to 1, we have a day with Walter Anderson. It's a family day. So there are hands-on activities. Um, author Hester Bass will be reading the book she wrote for children, The Secret uh, world of Walter Anderson, and I believe that uh, um, Hester is here this evening. Is that correct? Yes, Hester, there she is. Yes. So thank you, Hester. Um, yes. <laughs> thank you. And, um, and with that, you'll be able to follow in the footsteps of Walter Anderson by packing a paper sack lunch and going into the world to draw the wonders of nature. So it should be a nice day tomorrow. I think it's going to be in the 60s with no rain. So come on out, bring your families, tell everybody, tell your neighbors to come out. Um, Scott Bishop, as well, has put together two art cafes, uh, the first one being Thursday, November 1st at 6 p.m. Uh, Kevin O'Brien, the director of the Orr O'Keefe Museum of Art, will give a talk on George Orr, the world's first abstractionist art potter. And then the next week on Thursday, November 8th at 6 p.m., Jake Fussell, who's a musician and scholar of Southern Music, will give a talk modeled on his radio program, Fall Line Radio, exploring the musical side um, of the culture milieu in which Walter Anderson lived and worked. So there's three great programs surrounding this in the next few weeks. We welcome everyone to come and attend. Um, also, after this evening, after um, this program, we welcome everyone. There's a reception afterwards. Um, please stay, enjoy um, some hors d'oeuvres, a glass of wine, and, uh, and take in this opening of this wonderful exhibition. So please stay. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dennis Harper, our curator of collections and exhibitions. Thank you, everyone, for coming this evening. So I get to thank, uh, to thank some people, too. Um, actually, just one very important person who, without her encouragement, her accommodation, and her enthusiasm, we wouldn't have this exhibition here. And that's our guest speaker, Maddie Codling. Um, when I approached her some years ago uh, about doing an exhibition here, there had been a couple of smaller traveling exhibitions going around the Southeast. And I wanted something just a little bit larger, a little more inclusive. And I called up Maddie and proposed that idea to her. And she said, yeah, come on down. And so she was very um, joyful and um, a pleasure to meet and to take me through the vaults where we could look through some of the things that hadn't been uh, in the traveling exhibitions, that hadn't been on view, and to help craft this exhibition that gives a really broader look at uh, Walter Anderson's work from earliest period right up to nearly the very end of his life. So uh, thank you, Maddie, for allowing me that inside look and for working with me uh, on putting this together. So let me tell you a little bit about Maddie before she comes up and tells you about Walter Anderson. She is the director of collections and exhibitions at the Walter Anderson Museum in Ocean Springs, uh, Mississippi. If you haven't been there, I really recommend that you go. She's been a part of the WAMA, do you all call it WAMA? We do, of WAMA since April 2016. Prior to her employment at WAMA, 
um, she worked for various museums throughout the Southeast, including Mission San Luis in Tallahassee, Florida, the Oro O'Keefe Museum in Biloxi, Mississippi, which is another must see when you go down to the Walter Anderson Museum, and at um, the University of Mississippi Museum in Oxford, Mississippi. There's a little theme here, isn't there? <laughs> Mississippi. She completed her undergraduate work at the University of Mississippi, where she double majored in art history and anthropology. She received her master's degree in art history from Florida State University with a specialization in museum studies. Now her subject specialization encompasses not only um, Southern art, but Southern architecture, material culture of the African diaspora. She's participated in several archeological digs, including the Carson Burial Mounds, located outside of Clarksdale, Mississippi. And she's completed several field studies of the African dias uh, diaspora uh, cemeteries around Mississippi and in the Southeast. She's a recipient of the Taylor Medal from the University of Mississippi for her academic and scholarly experts while at University of Mississippi Museum, and of course is evident in our current exhibition and the topic that you see on screen here. Her present work revolves around the art and legacy of Walter Inglis Anderson, American master painter. So please join me in giving an extremely warm welcome to Maddie Codling. Name. Well, I have some thank yous as well. Thank you very much to uh, Dennis Harper for working with me and for answering all of my questions and um, my eccentric suggestions. And we, I think we've pulled something together really exciting. I hope you'll enjoy it. Thanks also to Scott Bishop for putting together my visit here. And uh, I was able to meet with your docents here at the museum and some of your art history students. And that was a, a real pleasure for me. So thank you very much. Uh, as Dennis mentioned, I am Mississippi through and through, and uh, so the title of today's talk is also Mississippi Mystic, The Life and Work of Walter Inglis Anderson. Um, and before we begin, uh, I just want to kind of address Walter's state within the realm of art history. So despite his popularity in the Southeast, he's, he's still relatively unknown for the art world. Uh, so some of the questions that I often get are, who is this man? Why is he important? And then also, how do I read that work? How do I read this work? And so I really think that it's part of truly examining these individual works. And some of them, as you'll see in the galleries, are very small. They're about eight and a half by 11. Uh, some are, are dirty, some are scratched. Um, some have burn marks. Uh, there are fingerprints on them, and those are all records of this artist's uh, creative process. And we'll learn a little bit more about how these works got into the shape that they are in, <laughs> making my job a little bit more difficult in the preservation. Uh, so I want us to take a look at his work and really, uh, really piece out these different layers. Walter worked beyond the physical realm. He's really delving into the emotional and the spiritual. And so through this presentation, I hope to help us examine the works to that level. So we'll take a look at the connection with nature, the influences of his life experiences, and then we'll delve a little bit deeper and parse out the physical, intellectual, and spiritual elements. Every movement you make is related to the movements of the pine trees in the wind, the movements of a man in the field flowing, the orbit of a star or the spiral movement of the sun itself. Walter Inglis Anderson. For Walter Anderson, all things were connected. Like a spiral begins at a single point and then works outward further and further, affecting the continuation of that line wider and wider, so humans and nature are related to one another. Anderson often described himself as the perpetual observer, taking time to study the movements of plants and animals, 
seeking out a kind of divine connection between himself and nature. Anderson's wife, Sissy, described him as a mystic and a shaman, seeking the supernatural in nature through the medium of art. For many, the artwork of Walter Anderson becomes a spiritual journey. His works are drawn and painted with an intimacy and raw vulnerability that engages and confronts his viewer. The artist is most well known for his Horn Island period, which are known as the last 15 years of his life, when he would take long journeys out to one of the barrier islands about 12 miles off the coast of Mississippi. The artist would spe and spend weeks at a time there, uh, painting, drawing, observing, and writing about the natural environment and his place within it. And this is a great photo of Walter on his way to Horn Island. Uh, Horn Island no longer looks like this. <laughs> we have a couple hurricanes to thank for that. Uh, so it's a little bit smaller. But if you notice, Walter is in his boat. And he's wearing this nice big jacket and hat. And he's barefoot. It's cold out, and he's barefoot. Uh, he's also sailing with, of course, a sail there, but he would also use an umbrella. But mostly he would, he would row every stroke out to Horn Island. Very strong person. So for those who are unfamiliar with Walter's life, I'll briefly go over the separate periods that led him to this final realization uh, between humans and nature. Walter was born in New Orleans, Louisiana in 1903 in the Garden District. And his father was a grain merchant, a very successful grain merchant. His mother was a student of Newcomb College. And if you're familiar with Newcomb at all, it, it was a training uh, college for young women in New Orleans to give them a trade and where they could earn a living themselves. And uh, she was very much influenced and she studied under William and Ellsworth Woodward, uh, who were very much part of the arts and crafts movement. She also studied with M William Merritt Chase. And uh, she, so she was a very learned, very artistic woman. And she really ingrained these ideas of art and literature and history into her three sons. So in these images, we have Walter, and then his elder brother, Peter, and little Mac, and uh, the three were very close their whole lives. They never lived separate for very long. Walter went on to study at the New York School of Fine and Applied Arts and the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. He won a travel scholarship to visit France and Spain. And there he visited two very different places, uh, which would have an effect on his artwork for the rest of his life. The first were the cave paintings from Laïsse, and the second was Shaw Cathedral, with its magnificent rose windows and its canon for art for the people, for the common man. So Walter was very much influenced by these works, and he brought a lot of these images back to Ocean Springs. And this is an image from the community center, which Walter created these massive murals within this space. And if you notice, Walter's put in a rose window here. This resurgence of the arts and crafts movement, and really this marriage of beauty and functionality, which was the epitome of what Shearwater was trying to, to show. This is a work that's in the exhibit, a uh, blue jay pot with two handles. And as you notice, the decoration doesn't just sit on the form, but it, it encompasses the form. It accentuates that form. And uh, this was really something that came, again, from their understanding of the arts and crafts movement and the influence of their mother. And uh, they always joked that she was their harshest critic. <laughs> Walter married Agnes Sissy Granstead in 1933, and they moved into a house on the Shearwater compound. For their house, Walter made a lot of the furniture that was used. Uh, this is the Blue Jay table. 
uh, as seen for obvious reasons. And uh, the top there is actually a single piece of cypress that he handpicked for this purpose. In 1937, Walter was diagnosed with severe mental illness. And for the next three years, he was in and out of hospitals, both in Maryland and in Mississippi, where he was uh, subjected to treatments such as hydrotherapy and electric shock therapy. He made a series of works titled The Alienado, or The Alien, beginning in his time in the hospitals and then continuing even after. And this is, this is The Alienado, um, one that we, we see most often. Uh, the perspective is obviously skewed within this image, uh, and this was done on purpose. Walter, Walker, Walter could create works that were in fine perspective, but uh, notice how these lines are skewed. Uh, he's exaggerated his hands and his feet, and he's almost in this it's, you know, splayed position there. Uh, and really, throughout the next 10 years, he's creating works very similar to this. It's always in the same position. And uh, I think it says a lot about his mindset at the time, very much alienated, very vulnerable. And uh, it's also possibly reflecting how his medication that he was uh, taking at the time was skewing his mind a little bit. Uh, Walter's last day in the Mississippi State Hospital culminated with his escape. Uh, he tore up his bed sheets, he formed a rope, he threw it out the window, and he repelled against this brick wall. Uh, he took the time to grab a bar of ivory soap, and as he's repelling, he draws a mural of birds on the side of the brick building for the patients and then also the nurses to find the next day. I think it, it, while they probably got a lot of joy and maybe a little chuckle out of it, it may have also been a bit of a jab, saying, I escaped you. In 1941, Walter moved with his wife, Sissy, and children to Old Fields, Sissy's family home in Gautier, Mississippi, which is about 30 minutes away from Ocean Springs. And this is the home pictured there. Uh, it no longer looks quite like this, again, hurricanes. Uh, and at this time, Walter became the primary caregiver for his children. He had two children at this time, and um, he, he took care of them. He read them fairy tales. He took them on these adventures to pick up arrowheads along the beach. And uh, his wife was having to take care of, of her ailing father, who was um, very sick during this period. So Walter is really their main caregiver. And this is the happiest time of his life, and also the most prolific. During this time, Walter creates his large-scale linoleum block prints. And uh, these are two examples, Jack the Giant, Jack and the Giant, and Cupid and Psyche. And Walt, during this period, Walter's telling his children all of these classic fairy tales and myths, and he's drawing inspiration for their love of these things. And uh, so Walter, in a way to make money, but also to create art for everyone, creates these large-scale linoleum block prints. And he carves them out of battleship linoleum. So in the nearby town of Pascagoula, uh, they were creating battleships for World War II. And uh, so this battleship linoleum was very accessible. And Walter would get these ginormous sheets. And uh, he would take them up to the attic. And he would carve. And uh, his eldest daughter said that there was this little mound of linoleum that would fall from the attic because he was creating just so much. And uh, there are several examples in the exhibit today. Um, but Walter's creating these in the mid-1940s. The, some of these are as big as nine feet in length. And he's never really acknowledged for this innovation. Um, Pablo Picasso is often given the credit for creating the first large-scale linoleum blocks. But those aren't done until the 1950s. Walter's doing these a full seven years, at least ahead of that time. In 
1947, Walter and his family moved back to the Shearwater compound and Walter and his wife Sissy separated. Uh, she went to live with his mother in a house there on the compound and Walter went back to the cottage that they had shared at the beginning of their marriage. And this is a little watercolor that Walter did of that cottage. During this time, the artist became more and more separated from his wife and children and even removing himself from society in general. He spent increasing amounts of time in his little room, which we'll talk about in a minute, and then also on the barrier islands of the Mississippi Gulf Coast, particularly Horn Island, uh, which was described as a small, inhospitable strip of land 12 miles off the coast of Ocean Springs. It's on Horn Island that Walter Anderson felt at peace, and he found a kind of communion with nature. He would set out in his boat in all kinds of weather, rowing up to 12 miles to reach this island, and there he would observe, paint, draw, and explore the majesty of nature. Walter had his final trip to Horn Island in 1965, and when he returned home, he told his wife that he had to be taken to the hospital. Uh, so he locked the door to his cottage and the little room, and he never returned. He spent his last weeks in New Orleans, Louisiana. When uh, his wife, Sissy, returned from the hospital, uh, she went into the cottage, and there was one room that she was never allowed in for the last 15 years of his life. And she actually had to break the lock off the door, and... Inside, she found the little room, and the little room murals. And uh, this room is a panoramic view of Horn Island. It goes through 24 hours, uh, beginning at dawn and culminating at dusk. And the idea is that when you stand in the middle of this room, you're really standing in the middle of Horn Island. And when Sissy entered the room, she noticed that the floor that she was standing on was covered in the watercolors and drawings and writings that he had done on Horn Island. And she said they were as thick as autumn leaves. Uh, there was also a trunk in the room, and Walter had neatly stacked some of what we believe are his favorites. Uh, a few of those are in the exhibit. And then uh, he had also burned a lot, and um, they were found in the fireplace of his cottage, you know, just little snippets here and there. And uh, it's estimated that he burned about 80% of his artwork, and that's what he would do on Horn Island to start a fire, is that he would use a used piece of paper, because at that time, Walter had reached the point where the creation of artwork was more important than an actual product. So a, an unused piece of paper was much more important to him than preserving these works. So with the discovery of the little room, Sissy really realized the genius of her husband at this point. You know, they had been estranged for about 15 years, and she had largely been a single parent to four children. Uh, she wrote... All that we found in the cottage is a testimony to his realization, to his torment and his exultation. It was an eloquent testimony, speaking to time itself. The spiral has no end. Sissy really realized that he was seeking. He was on this journey continuously. And art had been Walter's vehicle during this journey for spiritual understanding and mental healing. When one views Anderson's work, they really find a portrait in each individual work, a portrait of the artist striving to find his place within the world. So, like I mentioned, some of Walter's works are uh, unusual. They're small. They're about 8.5 by 11, the majority of them are. And they're on typewriter paper, which is not the most stable of materials. Uh, <laughs> a lot of them are torn, they're dirty, you will see fingerprints, uh, and I really think that these are more of a record of his time and his experience rather than individual artworks in themselves. These works were never meant to be viewed by the public. Uh, these were works that Walter often kept hidden 
uh, as we talked about earlier, you know, he burned about 80%. And if he was to know that we had a museum about his work, he'd probably try and burn the rest of it. Uh, <laughs> also, these works weren't meant to last forever. He never created them for that purpose. So the courthouse mural, uh, which is in the exhibition, this is painted on plywood, and uh, the paint is you know, beginning to flake off. And so that poses a problem for us as conservationists. And uh, it was also stored in his cottage, which was not uh, heat or humidity protected. Walter would often carry his watercolors and drawings or even just scrap paper in his hat. That is his hat. We have it at the museum, so you can come see it. Uh, he would also carry his models in his hat. And by models, I mean raccoons and squirrels and snakes. Also, a lot of his works were left into the elements. Uh, this is the deer, which is the only remaining part of a large sculpture called Father Mississippi. And uh, this was out front of Walter's home. And it was exposed to the elements, the salt water, the bugs. And then also, if somebody came by and they saw a piece that they liked, like a possum, there was a possum at one point, they'd say, hey, I like that possum, and he'd give it to them. He wanted art to be for everyone. And this is a watercolor of the original sculpture itself. So you can see the centralized figure is Father Mississippi with these um, great antlers that represent the tributaries. And then his body is the Mississippi River. There's the deer we just looked at. And as you can see, there are all these little birds and plants and all kinds of different things. I think this must have been the possum. There was also a cat somewhere around here. Uh, but of course, those are all lost. Walter would also use very cheap materials. And uh, the block prints are an excellent example of that uh, because he would print them on the backs of discontinued wallpaper. And, <laughs> and this is a great example. This is a tallow tree. And as you can see, the, the back is this beautiful floral print. Uh, and Walter would do this because he wanted art to be able accessible to everyone. And uh, so he would sell these for about a dollar a foot. And uh, we'll still have people who come in with rolled up pieces of wallpaper into the museum. And they're like, I think I found something. And it's like, yeah, you probably did. So um, those are always fun surprises to get. So as we talked about, Walter's work is more of a record rather than the individual art pieces themselves. Yes, they are visually stimulating and uh, jewel-like in their execution. But it's important for us to look beyond that physical nature. Throughout Walter's life, he was searching for that connection with nature and really that interconnecting web that permeates all facets of our existence. There is a quality of timelessness and majesty that Walter lent to even the most basic of creatures. He painted mice with the whimsy and resourcefulness of Anansi from West African folklore. He depicted a dead pelican in the sand with the same detail and reverence for life as the Renaissance memento mori. An image of an octopus with iridescent te tentacles brings to mind ancient Minoan vessels. And a little sparrow is depicted with the same devotion to scientific observation as that of John James Audubon. However, Walter's works do not only remind the bodies. Each person's going to have their own interpretation of them. But for me, I see, yes, there are birds. But then they also turn into these great uh, shapes and forms. And then also, they, they become these kind of angelic beings uh, that are almost otherworldly in their, in their execution. The image creates a likeness within the viewer. So we have this great triangular shape that he's created. 
And then the contrasting colors of the sunrise accentuate this very spiritual effect, almost making the bodies of these birds glow supernaturally. Walter loved to incorporate this yin-yang symbol into his sunrises, perhaps commenting about the interconnection between all things and nature. So, as seen through our analysis of the painting, when one moves beyond the physical and the intellectual, he or she can reach that third poetry. And the third poetry, according to Anderson, was inhabited by emotion and spirit. Walter Anderson's artwork has a way of latching onto one's soul through line and color and the disarming and vulnerable way which he depicts these images. Through Anderson's images, we gain a kind of communion with the creatures that he's shown us. It's almost like the experience that you have if you're ever walking in the woods and let's say, say you see a fox and they come out and they see you and you see them and for that instant, you know one another. Maybe you're a little frightened, you don't want to scare him off, and then he scampers into the bushes, and he's gone. The magic of Walter's work is that he recreates that experience time and time again. Uh, you can see the, the fear in this, this poor creature's eyes as he's being painted by the artist, but then also the loving detail, oops, I went too far, the loving detail that he's he's put into each feather. And uh, on a lot of these works, you'll also see where Walter has written a little bit. And so that's where we get this title, uh, Terror, the Little Devil, because Walter wrote that this little animal was a little terror. The only human portrait included in this exhibition is one that Walter created of himself his iconic hat perched upon his head, he gazes out and locks eyes with the viewer. It is interesting to note that the same intensity of gaze is put into his depictions of wild creatures. And let's just skip back just so you get that effect. When we consider Walter's commentary about the interconnectedness of all things, it's likely that Anderson is very much aware of what he is doing in this instance, communicating to the viewer that he and the painting's animal subjects are not so different after all. Anderson's self-portrait also gives the viewer an insight into the mind of the artist himself. The mental struggles that he had in the 1930s didn't just evaporate. They weren't something that went away overnight. It was a constant struggle to keep them at bay and to find solace and peace within himself. And I think we can see a lot of that struggle when we look at this image of the artist. There are hurried brush strokes. Uh, the colors he used are almost putrefaction, and the purples, yellows, browns are all applied hurriedly um, and forcefully. And when we look at something like this compared with the loving individual colors that he's depicted something like this owl with, I think we can tell a lot about his inner turmoil. Uh, it's almost as though he has to get it out, has to get that, that conflict out onto paper, because that's the only way that he can truly heal. The third poetry exhibition features works from the major periods of Walter's life, beginning with his early career and culminating with his work on Horn Island. The styles and techniques change drastically throughout his life, but the subject remains the same, one of nature and Walter Anderson's responding devotion. The physical painting is just the surface, but the intellectual, the spiritual, and emotional connections lie beneath, ready to be extracted by each viewer. The third poetry, as Anderson stated, is written by those who have brought nature and art into one thing. It is through Anderson's artwork that we find that third poetry, one shaped by history, legend, and ultimately through the eyes of the artist. Thank you.
Does anyone have any questions, thoughts, comments? No, that's okay. Yes, sir. Ash very much. Absolutely. And, and Walter is always, his work is always pulling from all these different areas of art history. And uh, he's, you know, he's being trained, he was trained at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Art and then also the New York School of Fine and Applied Arts. So he's gotten some of that same training. And um, so he's, he's very much aware of his surroundings, of the major movements in art history. And they're incorporated into his works. Uh, absolutely, he'll look back even to you know the ancients with Mayan uh, images and um, Aztec. He has Buddhist sculptures in one of the paintings. Um, so it's, it, he's pulling from all areas of art history. Absolutely. Saw a couple other hands. Yes, ma'am. A tremendous amount. We don't actually know. Um, so the museum itself was luckily untouched by the hurricane, but the family did uh, lose quite a bit of work. Uh, the storage facility uh, that they stored Anderson's works in uh, was right on the Shearwater compound, which is right next to the Gulf. And uh, so they packed everything away into their vault. And uh, during the storm, a felled tree uh, was pushed into the vault door uh, by the rising tide. And um, water seeped in over the, the bent door. And um, we don't really know how much was lost at that time. And in fact, things are still being found, which is really quite amazing. Uh, but Honestly, we don't know, it, but it was a terrible amount. Um, Walter Anderson's grandson, when he first opened up the door, water and just a slush of watercolors came spilling out. And um, it, was, it was a very, very much emotional and um, difficult time for their family and for the community as well. Uh, but I think the resiliency of the people who just chipped in and um, we're not really thinking about their homes quite as much, but saving this legacy and saving um, their identity, really. Anyone else? Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yes, so his children are also artists, um, and then his grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Um, his Two daughters are visual artists. One is also a dancer. Um, she just created a movement called Arif. Uh, <laughs> and uh, she is in her 80s, and she can move like a gazelle, let me tell you. Uh, and his, his grandsons are all very talented artists. Uh, Chris Stebley has formed a name for himself. Uh, on his own. Also, I don't know if any of you watch Ink Masters, uh, but one of Walter's grandsons was one of the Ink Masters uh, on that show, uh, Matt Stebley, and he owns a very successful tattoo shop, and I'm not joking, like, it's some awesome stuff. In fact, our director has a tattoo. A Stebley tattoo. Uh, and he, he owns a tattoo shop and gallery, and very talented. There's actually a two-year wait list to get a tattoo from this guy. Yes, yes. So get on the list early. <laughs> it's. <laughs> I like you. Uh, it's it's in Ocean Springs. It's on Government Street, very very near to the museum itself. Yes, sir. So uh, Peter's youngest son is the master potter at Shearwater. So he will be in there day after day creating these pots. And watching him is just like watching a machine. You know, he has done this 
for 40 something years, day in and day out, creating these beautiful forms. And he can just, he, he really likes to smack the clay down really hard, especially when I'm standing close. Uh, and so it splashes up. But uh, he just, his production and his hands just move. He knows the clay and he knows how it works. And then his son is the master potter in training. And then his grandson is the apprentice potter. <laughs> uh, so it's a whole family business. Uh, and then um, Peter's eldest daughter is uh, one of the decorators there. Um, Max's daughter is a decorator there. The family still runs the showroom. And uh, so they're all still very much involved with the production of artwork. And um, I was really amazed after, after the storm, there was never a question of whether they should rebuild. Uh, the, the, out of the 19 buildings that were on the Shearwater property, 17 were completely demolished, completely destroyed. And um, Margie, who is Peter's youngest daughter, when she was coming in, uh, she said she kept stepping over boards and you know all this stuff, and she was just trying to get to her house. Well, then she got to the plot, and she realized she had been stepping over her house. And, um, and it was really, they didn't waste any time. They began right away trying to salvage whatever was possible. And um, really, this younger generation of Andersons uh, stepped up and began this process because their parents were so overwhelmed. This had been their lives. You know, they didn't have anything else. That was it. And uh, so they would, about 12 hours a day, this is August in Mississippi, right after a hurricane. Yeah, that's, that's rough. Uh, they would get out there and they would dig and they would wade through the marshes and they found an astonishing amount for the amount of devastation. Really a true story of the human spirit, absolutely. Any other questions? No? Maybe? You all want to go drink some wine? <laughs> Excellent. Well, please feel free to come up and ask me any questions afterwards. I'm happy to answer them. Thank you all so much.